Thanks, Marissa. For, thanks, Marissa, for the introduction. Um, so uh, let's start. Uh, first, uh, a few words about uh, us, the presenters. Uh, I'm Avi. I'm the original maintainer of uh, Linux kernel-based virtual machine. Uh, and now I'm a co-maintainer of uh, CSTAR, which is an IO framework that was used to build SelaDB, um, a NoSQL database that is um, an open source NoSQL database by our company. And I'm also a co-founder of uh, the company. Oh, Hi, my name. Yeah, my name is Pavel. Uh, <clears throat> I used to be a Linux kernel hacker. Uh, you probably also know me from the Creo project. Uh, and now I am playing in the database area with uh, with CSTAR and CODB. Okay, so um, the presentation is not about uh, CODB, but it will help to understand why we're doing all this. To, to have to understand what CELADB is. It is a NoSQL database with a strong focus on high performance, low latency, and scalability. Uh, it's compatible with Apache Cassandra and uh, Amazon DynamoDB. Uh, so you can run existing workloads just with a lower cost and better performance and uh, reduced uh, throughput. Um, so because of that, we have a heavy interest in, um, in IO performance. Um, a few of our users, I want to read this slide. Um, so let's start with uh, part one of the presentation, uh, mixed workloads. Uh, you might wonder uh, why we're starting with mixed workloads and not with uh, read-only workloads or write-only workloads. Uh, but the reason is that the modern disks are uh, so amazingly fast that the read-only workloads or the write-only workloads are not a problem. And here you can see uh, specifications for uh, a Samsung uh, SSD, and they're just amazing. Uh, uh, you can see six gigabytes per second uh, uh, read throughput. And by the way, some, Samsung is not the uh, sponsoring uh, this talk, just a random spec I picked up on the web. Um, although I would love to receive a sample if anyone from Samsung is listening. Um, so again, SSDs are pretty amazing. Uh, you get, you get a, a million random IOPS if, if they're read IOPS. And it's pretty hard to exploit a million uh, read IOPS in a workload. So you're not going to saturate the disk. And very often you have multiple disks in a, in a single server. You might have eight of them. So you actually have uh, 8 million read IOPS in a server and more than a million write IOPS per server. So the disk itself is amazing. Uh, but it's not magic. So you can get either of those specs, but you cannot get all of them at the same time, at least on most disks. So you get some kind of mix. You, you might get uh, half the read workload and half the write workload. But before we, we, um, we need to understand exactly what kind of mix that this supports and make sure that uh, we're running a mix that is within the disk uh, capacity. If we're running a mix that is outside the disk capacity, we will just get the variable latency or the workload does not uh, complete. So why are we interested in uh, mixed workloads? Um, well, there's the main workload for CLDD is online transaction processing. There's a real user usually at the other end. Uh, so we're interested in providing uh, low latency for our workload. Uh, but in parallel with this uh, workload, we also have maintenance workloads that are generally inter generated internally that are running in parallel. Uh, so we might be scaling out the database, adding more nodes or removing nodes after a scaling out operation is uh, complete and no longer needed. Uh, there is a compaction, which is where the database merges multiple files. It reads the files sequentially and writes out a, a new file. And by reducing the number of files, it uh, improves 
uh, read response. And there can be a backup operation running. So while uh, the other workloads are running, we're also reading from the disk. Um, the, we, the database can also run an analytics workload in parallel with the online um, transaction processing workload. And the idea here is that uh, there is spare uh, CPU and disk bandwidth, and we want to use it. We want to. Uh, we don't want to let the machine go idle, and we want to use it towards something productive like uh, analytics. Um, but we don't want it to hurt uh, the main workload. And also, there's there are multi-tenancy workloads where you're running several different OLTP workloads together uh, using the same CPU, disk, and uh, and data. Uh, and that's common with the microservices, where uh, each microservice can be regarded as a tenant, and they're all operating uh, on the same data, but they might um, uh, they might not share uh, the same uh, service level agreement. So the challenge is to allow all those workloads to run concurrently, but prevent one of them, usually the sequential workload, uh, from dominating the, the disk and hurting the other workloads. It's very easy for a sequential workload to consume all of the uh, disk capacity uh, and make the, uh, the random I.O. Uh, behave poorly. Uh, and we'll see how we do that. So part two is understanding exactly what kind of uh, mixed workloads that this can support going uh, beyond the specifications. It just shows you uh, uh, only single use workloads like sequential reads or, or random runs. So to do that, uh, we built a, a tool called the Disclore. Uh, it is uh, open source and the URL is there. So uh, like, share, and subscribe. Uh, it's written in Python. It's based on uh, Jens Axbo's uh, FIO. And it uses the matplotlib to generate the, the fancy graphs. And it takes quite a long time to run because it does very uh, detailed um, experiments on the disk. Um, so if you want to play with it, make sure you, you set uh, some time for the tool to run. So let's, let's look at the sample results. Uh, these results are from an Amazon uh, I3 EN instance. Um, so those are uh, instances with an ephemeral disk. And uh, um, uh, we ran Disclorer on that. And let's look at the results. And the chart is very information dense. So let's, uh, let's look at what the results mean. Uh, so on the x-axis, we have uh, we're varying uh, the write bandwidth from zero to one gigabyte per second, which is uh, what the maximum that this drive supports. And on the y-axis, we're varying uh, the the read uh, I/O operations per second uh, from zero to around two hundred fifty thousand operations per second, uh, and this is a matrix, so we're running um, about uh, we're running 21 different uh, right bandwidth settings and 21 different uh, read I/O settings, and so 441 different experiments uh, overall. Each experiment runs for 30 seconds, and the experiment measures the read latency, which you can read off on the color bar on the right. So the cyan uh, color. Uh, is around uh, 100 microseconds, 0 0.1 milliseconds. And uh, the colors vary uh, towards the blue and then uh, this ugly purple, uh, which is about five milliseconds. And the areas of the graphs that are white uh, are areas where there, we were not able to push uh, both. So for example, if we try to push 800 megabytes per second, and 150,000 uh, read IOPS, then the disk just cannot support it, even though it, it can support each one of them independently. Uh, but if we try to push 600 uh, megabytes per second and 100,000 IOPS, then oops, 
uh, then it will be uh, well supported. And you can, from the color, you can infer that uh, the latency is it's above uh, uh, 100 microseconds, but not a lot. So basically, it's instantaneous. Uh, there are two charts for every uh, this color one. The upper chart gives the 50th percentile, and um, the the lower chart gives the um, the 95th percentile. Uh, so you can see the 95th percentile is affected much more when you're uh, running closer to the limits. Uh, so you might want to stay out of this area uh, where you get those uh, uh, purple blotches. Um, uh, let me see, there's a question. Um, okay, there was a question uh, whether the reads and writes are sequential or random. And it's an important question, I should have said it. So the writes are uh, sequential and the reads are random. And the reason why we, uh, uh, the reason why it's uh, so important is that uh, this is how our database uh, operates. Uh, it does not do random writes. So uh, a database that uses uh, B trees will use, will generate random writes and they behave very differently from sequential writes. But our database uses the uh, log structured merge tree, which means, um, write activity is done by uh, merging large files. So an initial write is written to the commit log, which is sequential. And then the data is dumped into for memory into an SS table, which is a large sequential file on disk. And then compaction uh, picks up uh, uh, several SS tables that have a similar size. And uh, those SS tables are sorted. That's the first S in, uh, in the name. And, um, and then a merged file is written. So basically we have random reads to serve the, uh, uh, the queries, the read queries, and we have uh, sequential reads and sequential writes uh, to serve writes and uh, operations like, uh, uh, like backup and scaling. Uh, so yes, it's a good question. Um, Okay, so uh, let's uh, move on to the next instance type. This is a, a new instance, uh, uh, an ARM-based instance, uh, again, uh, from Amazon, uh, and it has a near disk. So you can see that the uh, uh, read and write uh, ranges are similar to uh, the older disk. Uh, one gigabyte per second write bandwidth and 250,000 read IOPS. But the combination of workloads that work and that give uh, good latency are much larger than the combinations uh, from the previous uh, uh, instance. Of course, in your disk, they, they invested some effort into making, um, in improving the latency response. This is the, no. I'm, I skipped over a, a chart here. Okay, so let's do this out of order. Uh, the reason that um, uh, it's purple here and not white is that this is using um, an older version of uh, this floor that did not, did not mark so much uh, um, the areas of the chart where uh, we failed to perform the workload this white. And I didn't want to spend the hours running the workload again. Um, so let's look at yet another instance type. This is the i3.3x large instance. Uh, actually, I think it's 2x large. And you can, this is a much older instance. So the disks are not as good. Uh, and you can see that the, even the 50th percentile uh, is, gives not so good results uh, uh, near this uh, diagonal line. And the 95th percentile is pretty bad. Maybe the disks themselves are also older and which reduces their performance. It's hard to say because we don't have access to those metrics. Uh, let's look at the uh, measurements from another cloud provider. So this is a, a Google Cloud Platform um, a system. And 
they are running uh, uh, the, uh, the local storage is provided in a different way. So you have uh, SSD slices, which are just 375 gigabytes, but you can merge uh, multiple slices together in using RAID 0, and this is what we measure here. Uh, so you can see that um, the results depend on the right throughput, but the dependency is not so pronounced. Uh, and basically, you have to keep under 400,000 uh, IOPS if you want to get a good latency. So it's interesting that uh, uh, different disks behave differently. Uh, in this case, the, the Google disks, uh, they're really managed by the hypervisor and not uh, you're not directly accessing the SSD, so it behaves very differently from uh, other disks. Other disks behave more like the Amazon disks. Um, this is again a, a Google Cloud Platform, but here we're looking at the persistent disk. So this is a network attached disk, uh, not a local NVMe. And uh, here we see the a similar pattern that we had with uh, the Amazon disks, but uh, notice that uh, the rates are much lower. You, you cannot, from a network attached disk, you cannot get the same uh, amazing um, IO per second and, and throughput that you can get from uh, a locally attached disk. So it's about uh, uh, 20 times lower, but we see the same diagonal um, uh, diagonal graph that uh, uh, appears on, on many disks. There is some strange artifact in the 95th percentile where you get the bad 95th percentile latency on the uh, lower range of the read IOP. I, I don't have a good explanation uh, why this happens. It could be uh, a, a problem with the test. It could be, I don't know what it could be. But it's uh, it's very strange that uh, when you're running with uh, lower uh, lower IOPS, you get the uh, worse 95th percentile. Um, it could be that you have a fixed number of requests that return with uh, higher latency, and that fixed number of requests, when divided by uh, a smaller number of uh, overall requests, gives uh, they, they peak out into the 95th percentile. Whereas at the 12,000 IOPS, they get drowned out by, um, uh, by the higher uh, fast request. So don't really have an explanation for that. Uh, we don't generally use persistent disks or the equivalent uh, in Amazon uh, EPS because they are uh, so much slower than uh, locally attached disks. Um, and finally, we have uh, uh, a hard drive. Uh, I guess everyone forgot about them, but they still exist. Uh, the numbers are really, uh, really low. So you only reach 120, not 120,000, 120 operations per second. And uh, in theory, you can get to 200 megabytes per second. But if you do that, then uh, your read throughput, your read the IOPS are, uh, are very low. and the uh, read latency shoots up. So use SSDs. Uh, um, so um, that's it uh, for this floor. And uh, again, it's open source. And uh, I will, if you want to experiment with it and uh, generate uh, graphs for your disk, then please send the pull requests uh, with, um, uh, with your results. Uh, and I will incorporate them. The, the README page has uh, the same result that I present, presented, and I would love to extend it with uh, uh, results from uh, more exotic disks. Um, let, me, let me check if there are questions, and if not, then we will move, up, move on to, uh, uh, to Pavel's uh, section. Uh, so there is a question, what is a total cost if we migrate to AWS Cloud? Well, I, it really depends on uh, uh, on what you're doing, I can't tell what your workload is. Um, and I see a question, uh, performance appears to 
abruptly cut off on the last slide. So this would probably be the, uh, the hard disk, the, the, the spinning disk. Um, and uh, yes, it's because uh, the, the spinning disk uh, uh, can only achieve its uh, maximum uh, right throughput uh, if it doesn't serve any other reads. As soon as it starts to serve reads, then the disk, the disk head needs to seek. And uh, as soon as it seeks, it gets uh, extremely slow. Uh, so um, uh, like I said, don't use hard disks for performance sensitive workloads. OK, I guess the, that's, that's the questions uh, so far. So let's move over to uh, Pavel's section of the talk where he explains how we architected our IO scheduler to, to keep the workload within that uh, nice cyan colored part rather than the, the purple parts. Over to you, Pavel. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you, Ali. So uh, once we know the disks behave like this, uh, what can we do with this knowledge? Uh, that's uh, part three of the webinar. One of the possible applications uh, of the knowledge is to dispatch I.O. into disk somehow to get the best latency possible. And that's what our goal in Scylla. Uh, and here is how we do it. Uh, well, apparently, when pushing the request into disk, the dispatcher should stay inside this safety area reported by the disk explorer. But there are two challenges here. Uh, first, the safety area can be quite tricky. Uh, it can be convex or be cut off at high write ops or uh, have some other weird form. Uh, but by and large, it's generally more bluish towards zero point and more purplish towards larger bandwidths and IOPS. A decent approximation to treat the area is a triangle with corners in zero and uh, along the axis. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, shown on the plot is not a full picture. Disks has uh, four speeds, two IOPS for read and write, and two bandwidths for the same. Uh, so the triangle in question is actually a 4D uh, triangle-like, maybe, space. And Disk Explorer just drew a flat slice from it. Uh, so in the form of equations, uh, this linear safety area would look like this. Uh, it's the sum of normalized bandwidths and diopsis, uh, which uh, should be less than some constant. Uh, in many cases, the constant is 1.0, but uh, some disks with a convex safety area call for smaller value, uh, as well as some other disks maybe call for larger value. Uh, and this equation is something we can work uh, with once we solve the second difficulty. <clears throat> and the second difficulty is that the safety area equation defines some relations between IO bandwidths and IOPS. And both bandwidths and IOPS are time derivatives, or in simple words, speeds. They are something per time values. Uh, when one observes a flow of requests, it's not possible to get an instant value of a bandwidth or IOPS. Uh, one needs to apply some approximations on it, uh, taking sliding averages or alike. And since, since any math of that kind is a statistics and thus collects some history of the measurement, uh, the speed value that we get is likely missing some spikes. So the decision based on that may jump out of the safety area. Uh, some good news is that we don't need to really calculate those speeds, but uh, we can take a shortcut. Uh, <clears throat> the shortcut is the well-known algorithm called token bucket. It takes two inputs. First is the rated flow of tokens, and the second is a chaotic flow of requests. And it generates an output, a rated flow of requests. It does so by assigning each request a certain amount of tokens, and once a bucket has at least this amount of tokens for a request, uh, the request grabs the tokens and can be dispatched. Uh, and in, term of, in terms of equations, the algorithm introduces a resource R associated with individual requests. It needs to calculate the sum of Rs that flow into it, and it guarantees that the speed at which the R flows out of the bucket 
is limited by the rate tokens input. And that's exactly what we need. Uh, it's possible to take the original equation of the safety area, uh, a piece of paper and a pencil, or I don't know, a mathematical package maybe, uh, modify the equation a little bit and convert it into a form that's exactly the token bucket equation. <clears throat> this thing in the braces uh, is the resource value that's fairly easy to account. Uh, that's what we get combining it all together. Uh, a token bucket with one hertz incoming rate uh, tokens. Uh, each request is assigned a value of one divided by the maximum IOPS uh, plus its size divided by the maximum bandwidth. Uh, and the bucket emits the outgoing flow of requests that fully conforms to the original safety area equation. Uh, it only takes some efforts to get used to floating point tokens, but that's fairly easy. And to the fact that the request is measured in seconds. But other than this, uh, such a dispatcher can keep uh, the outgoing flow of requests under this green line. Uh, and another good news is that it will be possible to control the dispatcher intensity with uh, just a single parameter, the limitation constant. Uh, by moving this green line up and down, thus expanding or shrinking the safety area depending on its uh, exact form. Uh, however, one may tell that, okay, we stay in this safety area, but that's an area. Uh, the dispatcher is free to stay at any point of it and still get good latency results. What exactly should it do? Uh, that's right, one more step here is needed. And before getting there, let's switch to another known dispatcher, a CPU scheduler. Uh, in Linux and actually in the CSTAR2, uh, the CPU scheduler maintains a set of so-called uh, entities and schedules the CPU time between them. And there are two numbers associated with each entity, the runtime and virtual runtime. The former one is literally the total time an entity had CPU time for. And the latter one is the runtime that's adjusted in two ways. First, it's divided by the entry, uh, entity priority. In CSTAR, we call it shares. So that the entities with higher priorities uh, have smaller virtual runtime, and the scheduler would give them more uh, real runtime. Uh, the second adjustment is when the entity wakes up from being idle. Uh, in this case, the virtual runtime can be increased. Uh, not to give the new entity a non-preemptible boost uh, against others. In the I.O., the same thing can be applied. Uh, if the request cost is what the request needs from the disk, uh, this sum of uh, normalized uh, one and its length, uh, then accumulating the costs uh, normalized by the stream shares uh, and of course, the I.O. scheduler should have some concept of streams, flows, or groups. Uh, it can attribute a bunch of requests to. Uh, so if we do this normalization uh, and sum up the results, then we get the exact uh, analogy of the virtual runtime in the CPU scheduler. And using this value, uh, we can first balance the disk throughput consumption between different classes. And the second thing is that this normalized I.O. time, or whatever it can be called, uh, it defines yet another line in the scheduling decision area uh, on the intersection of the capacity limit line and the weights balancing line. There is a point uh, at which the scheduler is going to load the disk, uh, the exact uh, read bandwidth or read IOPS and exact write bandwidth, uh, and of course, uh, write IOPS. Uh, so, uh, this is it, uh, from my side. Uh, now we can go to the Q and A part. Um, yes, there were a couple of uh, questions, which I answered in writing. Um, so if, if there are, um, if there are more questions or if someone wants to uh, uh, elaborate on any questions, then we'll be happy to answer. 
And if not, then go and download this Chlora and run it on your disks. But uh, be careful because it's a destructive test. So don't run it on disks where you have uh, data. Okay, I guess there are uh, no more questions. So thanks everyone for attending. Um, do take out the uh, Discord for uh, a run or drive and uh, also try out the uh, Sela DB. And uh, so thanks are pretty interesting. Oh, I see we do have a questions. Um, can you describe the differences between uh, AWS and GCP disks. Uh, so let, let me let me pull them up. Um, Uh, Avi, Avi, you're on mute. Yeah, I forgot to click that small button that uh, stops audio from the tab. Um, okay, so keep in mind that the uh, uh, what I have to say here is somewhat speculative. I don't know how Google or Amazon uh, implement this. Uh, so maybe I just uh, uh, inventing a big theory that's completely wrong. But I believe that uh, Amazon disks are more or less a straightforward path through to regular NVMe disks. And uh, that most uh, SSDs will give a behavior that's similar to the Amazon disk. And the, my explanation for this diagonal line is that uh, the disk uh, has an internal bottleneck, which is, uh, uh, it could be either the, the controller, so the small CPU within the disk that manages the, all the activity, or it could be that the, the chips themselves, themselves, the, the SSD is composed of uh, of uh, flash uh, chips and uh, eventually they all get busy and uh, when they get busy you're you hit the, the limit of the disk and instead of the throughput increasing the latency starts to increase uh, so this um, uh, this uh, diagonal line shows you where the limit is hit uh, the let's let's uh, imagine that the limit is the uh, ssd chip uh at one point uh, so every io consumes some capacity from an ssd chip uh you, you need to open the page and perform a read or perform a write and then close the page and if you're doing a sequential read or write then that operation is a lot cheaper than the equivalent number of uh, random reads or random writes but you have to hold the chip open for longer because you're, uh, you, you need to transfer the data. And, and that's the origin of the sequential line. Each, uh, uh, each type of workload consumes something from the, um, from the resource that is the bottleneck, either the controller or the SSD chips. And you, you, the diagonal line shows where all of the resources are, uh, are, are, are fully consumed. Uh, and uh, for Google, there is a lot more uh, involvement of uh, the hypervisor. So there's more software and, and more involvement of uh, uh, the host hypervisor. Uh, and because of that, and, and the host hypervisor has a lot more resources at its disposal uh, than the disk. And so you, you see less, uh, um, less uh, interference between the two workloads. Uh, and 
I imagine that uh, uh, the latency is, uh, uh, comes from the disk, but the ability of the disk to sustain uh, reads and writes almost without interference, you, you do see that there is some, uh, uh, some difference between uh, workloads with a low write bandwidth and workloads with a high write bandwidth, but it's lower than we were used to. And my theory is that uh, uh, more of the workload is handled by the hypervisor, which has a huge number of cores at its disposal, so it's able to, um, it, it doesn't hit the bottleneck. Um, but uh, the actual read latency that comes from the disk itself, and there's nothing that the hypervisor can do to cover that, other than cache the entirety of the disk. I'll, I'll mention that the disk explorer takes uh, great pains to um, defeat any optimizations. So it uh, uh, pre writes the entire disk that can take several hours to uh, because. Uh, uh, the SSD can optimize reading from an area that was not previously written to and just return it immediately without exercising uh, the SSD chips. Uh, and uh, it uh, avoids using a file system so as not to have interference. It works directly with uh, the raw disk. So th there was some effort uh, expended to make the results reliable. But of course, there, there might be surprises and uh, uh, there can always be bugs. Uh, okay, I hope I answered that question. If there are more questions, please uh, 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 ask further questions. I see a question, are there any free options to practice with this technology as a student? So both Disclorer and CSTAR and CELADD are open source and you can practice with it as a student or with your production workload. It's, uh, they're both free. Um, uh, a question I see on CELADD, I suppose the assumption of random reads doesn't always hold. Um, so that's true, uh, and yes, with the time-based compaction strategy or when, uh, when, when uh, doing sequential scans instead of uh, random reads, then you will get uh, random reads. Uh, but uh, uh, the scheduler doesn't assume that uh, all of the reads are random. The scheduler uh, looks at every uh, I operation and it uh, examines the uh, the size and the direction. So if it's read or write, and it uh, assigns the uh, it assigns a token weight according to uh, the equation that uh, Pavel presented. So we don't really look at whether it's a sequential or, or random, but we do assign a much higher weight to uh, the larger uh, I/O that comes from. Um, that usually are associated with sequential reads and writes and uh, a lower rate for uh, random reads and random writes, which basically don't really happen. Avi and Pablo, it looks like another question just came through. Uh, yeah, okay, let me read it. So would it be possible to use your approach in a generic block layer IO elevator? Uh, yes, that's, well, one of the questions that uh, I expected but wasn't asked was why not use uh, uh, the Linux uh, scheduler um, and the answer to both of them is that uh, it would be possible if uh, a lot of work was invested, but uh, it's not uh, possible now, and it would actually make a very good solution. The, the, uh, our, our IO scheduler has one piece of information that uh, the Linux IO scheduler does not have, and that is the assignment of um, 
um, of I/O operations to separate workloads. So our I/O scheduler knows whether a, a particular read is part of a, um, a query read that needs to be assigned high priority, or whether it's part of a compaction or backup that can uh, run with much lower priority and really should use just the idle bandwidth. And the Linux R scheduler doesn't have this assignment. Uh, a, uh, a previous scheduler, so the, uh, I think it was called the stochastic fair scheduler or stochastic fair queuing, uh, assumes that each process uh, was running a, a different workload and, and tried to be fair among them. But uh, the, first of all, that assumption is not true. You often have one process running multiple workloads and um, and uh, we don't, you don't have a way to tag that. And also the mechanisms to tag the priority are, are not flexible enough. You have only a small number of priorities, uh, whereas with our scheduler, you have uh, shares, which are more or less equivalent to um, process priority shares. So it would make lots of sense to push this into Linux, but it's also a lot of work. And the APIs are not ready for it because there is no way to tag uh, IOs with uh, the priority, the, the classes that they, the workload classes that they belong to. Uh, I guess with the IO Uring, uh, it becomes easier now because there is a, a more generic way to uh, uh, to send IOs. So an IO could be extended with the information about the. Um, uh, the classification of each IO into a separate workload. So it would be really interesting, but also a lot of work. All righty. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought another question came through. So thank you so much, Avi and Pavel, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Just a quick reminder that this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope that you will join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thank you again.